hello to everyone. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Thank uh, Dr. Sheriff for the, the kind invitation. I'm very glad to be here. I'm looking to be on the clinic, so now I'm doing a lot of webinars and education. Uh, and I'm very glad to be here. I think it's a very good uh, initiative. And my topic for today uh, will be uh, different people's treatment options in the topic job. So where I'm from, I'm from a beautiful country uh, in Europe uh, that has beautiful landscape, has beaches, has rivers, has the sea. So it's a very typical country, very small, but um, very cozy. And we have beautiful music also called club. If you don't know where I'm from, probably you'll see the next um, picture and you'll know. So I think everyone knows Cristiano Ronaldo, the best player in the world. He's Portuguese and I'm also very proud to be Portuguese. Um, and we are a nation that are fighting for all the time. We're a very small nation, but uh, conquered a lot of things, inclusive the um, football um, uh, European League uh, Cup. So I'm from Portugal and I love my country. I live in the north uh, in a small city called Oporto that is uh, very picturesque, very colorful uh, and has a lot of cellars. And uh, one of the main um, activities in the city is the production of uh, Oporto wine that is world famous. So if you want to visit, you're more than welcome. It's a very, very nice city. So I started to present where I came from. Now I'm presenting a little bit who I am. Uh, so I'm Raquel, everyone knows, and uh, I'm a dental medical doctor uh, with a master's degree and a PhD and specialization in implantology. And uh, I'm also a certified oral surgeon. And all in, my, in all my presentations, I like to always present my collaborations to show that I collaborate with some brands, some universities, some platforms, and I always choose the brands, the platforms, the universities I think uh, are the best for me and for my patients and my students. So these are some of my collaborations that I'm very proud to, to represent. So where should we start? We have one hour. It's a demanding topic, but I always got, go, uh, like to start the going back to the basis. So let's back to some basic concepts. So after it, you can understand all my sequence of um, clinical cases. So as we know in, in nature and in architecture, it's very important the roots or the foundations. They are the key for long-term survival. We have the same philosophy and the same concept applied to implants. So that's why sometimes we, we play with the colors and say the red for surgery, the pink for perio, and the white for aesthetics. But to have a good aesthetics, we need to have a good foundation, the red, and then a good integration in the soft tissue, the pink, and then after a good tint. That is the, the, the one that uh, the patient is, is seeing. So, to start with some uh, basic concepts that are very important, taking decisions, we should consider loading protocols. We have basically three types of different loading protocols, immediate, early, or delay. I'm going to explain the difference between the three. And then we have three um, main characteristics that we have to take in account to decide if we should go for one or two or three type of loading protocol. And these characteristics are the ISQ, that stands for Implant Stability Quotient, the torque, I mean the insertion torque of the implant, and the bone density of the place we are putting the implant. So about the loading protocols, as we know, is not uh, all, they are not the same. So we consider immediate loading if we do um, the, the temporization until 48 or 72 hours after placement. It doesn't mean it has to be in the same hour or has to be in the same day. It's considered still immediate loading to um, when we do it 48 or 72 hours after. Early, we consider 48 hours to 12 weeks and then delayed 
for after three or more months. So we have several methods to, to, to measure the primal stability. We have some that are a little bit subjective, like percussion, x-ray, just looking at it, or place the place the resistant. And we have some two very objective methods to, to measure the primal stability when we put the implant, that is the torque and ISP. So let's focus on these two. So as everyone knows, the torque is the, the measure that most of the, the implantologists use to take the decision if we should do immediate loading or not. And uh, it measures only the rotational stability and we can only uh, measure it once. The only way of measuring more than once is doing like the reverse torque and we only do that in uh, research. What about the ISQ, the implant stability quotient? is a different measure that is complementary from the torque and measures the actual stability or vibrational stability. And we can uh, measure it several times, not only in the placement of the implant, but after we can do the follow-up of the, the, the health of the implant during the time, several times with the ISQ. So, but what is ISQ? I know not all the people are using in a daily basis. I'm using this in a daily basis for at least eight years. And I think it's a fundamental um, tool to take decisions. So basically it's a scale of stability that goes from one to a hundred. Okay. And it's measuring uh, the vibration of, of, of the implant stability with the bone. And the set stability goes more or less between 55 and 85. Normally, if you have a high primary stability, it goes down with time. If you have a low primary stability, it goes up. And if you have a drop, a very quick drop, uh, it's a sign that you have a problem with this implant during the healing. So how can we measure? It's very easy. You have a smart bag that is a specific tip for each uh, uh, implant or for each connection of the implant. And um, uh, it can be measured also with this uh, vibration uh, uh, waves um, of the apparatus. And it can be uh, used several uh, types of uh, apparatus, uh, namely uh, Penguin from Brethren, Tostel, or uh, Mega ISQ from Medigen. So this is the normal behavior uh, that is described in the literature of the ISQ. So normally we have uh, a starting point and then we have a break um, about three, four weeks and then we start again uh, um, raising the ISQ values. This is what is proved in the literature. Uh, but uh, sometimes we need to search for different things and uh, uh, during my PhD I did some research on, on uh, impossibility and I started to, to study the worst case scenario that is the posterior maxilla. And you compare three different groups uh, of bone regeneration, like heel tight, uh, post fractional with the uh, uh, GPR simultaneously and uh, sinus lift and feeling before the implant placement. And we find very interesting results uh, that we had like a very stable uh, progression of the ISQ even in this worst case scenario. What we think, there are several explanations, but the, the, mainly uh, the main uh, explanation to, to justify this is that um, the macrostructure of the implant is uh, uh, important to, to maintain this primary stability. In this case, this macrostructure was very specific. It was a macro um, implant um, case. So, why should we have this kind of values? Why is this important for my clinical uh, daily practice? It's very important. So this is kind of a guideline, it's like a, a, a traffic uh, light. So if I have uh, an ISQ value that is red, it's, it's a low stability, I should not do an immediate loading. I should even use a cover screw. If I have a medium stability that is a yellow light, should be a medium stability and I can put a heel in the button. If I have a high stability, that is the, the, um, the green light, I can do an immediate loading with no problem. But is it the same being single or being multiple? No. So we're going to debate that. So when we think about single implants, to be um, totally sure of what we are doing and to have a guideline that is always the same, if you have torque less than 30 and ISQ less than uh, 60, 
we should do it a cover through. So we should do a two surgical stage approach. If I have to work more than 30 and um, less than 45, and I ask you between 60 and 70, the immediate uh, exposure is recommended, but with a healing apartment, not with immediate only. Okay, so and if I have the torque more than 45 and that is still more than 72, I can perform immediate loading with a good uh, previsibility. But when I talk about multiple, uh, it's a little bit different situation because all the implants are together, so I can uh, um, put the, the values a little bit down. So in this case, instead of 30, I can consider the, the threshold of 25. Uh, for cover screw, and then from 25 to 40 for healing abutment, and more than 40 immediate loading. Also, the ISQ, the only change is for immediate loading. In the single, we consider more than 72, and in the multiple, we consider more than 70. Also, as I told, there were three main criteria for deciding the, the type of loading uh, the torque insertion torque, the ISQ, and the bone density. We have this classification that I call the old school uh, bone classifications uh, that are quite uh, uh, old, like 1985, 1987. Um, the first one was from Lenton And we have this traditional classification between the one and the five bone. But this is like uh, an artificial classification, of course, and we have to uh, start working to, to feel the difference between the, the bone density. But nowadays, what can we expect before we start to work? And this is what I call the bone density classification, the new school, okay? And the new school is what? We can go to a CVCT or a TC, ideally to a TC, and with uh, uh, the radiological niche classification of bone density in house health unit, we have a categorization between D1 and D5. So I go to the place I want to put the implant and I mark that place with a program that can be, for instance, implant claw. And then I can uh, know uh, before I go to surgery what will be my density of the bone. This is very important, uh, namely for someone that is starting uh, and wants to do immediate loading. Please don't promise your patients before you see all these informations and gathering all these informations. Also, uh, I studied a little bit this topic, and um, because we know that this is true for uh, TC uh, uh, scan uh, values, but we also uh, try to do some research in CBCT, and we found very interesting results. Uh, because we found some correlation between the ISQ, the TOR, and the bone density in the CBCT. We also published that article. Um, at, at that time, it was something very new because it was in 2014. And even nowadays, there's some people that don't believe that the CBCT can measure uh, in a very precise way the bone density. But more and more is more used. And if you use the same apparatus and the same uh, um, calibration, you can use this as a, a, a way to uh, um, uh, at least have an idea of the quality of wound that you have uh, during the operatory. So when you consider a single classification of insufficient bridges, I have this like map uh, of decisions, basically. So when I have a socket, I have to choose between uh, immediate placement and socket preservation basically. Uh, a low ridge, we have very um, several uh, chances of uh, solving. Short implants, tilted implants, traditional GBR, walks, trees pass, lateralization or transmission of the nerve. Uh, thin ridge, we have other kind of um, techniques, namely GBR, like the sausage technique by Eastern Urban, time mesh, mini implants. Or in the maxillary sinus, we also have like two kind of approaches or to avoid the sinus. So we have the press or the lateral approach, or we can uh, avoid the sinus with tilted implants or zygomatic implants. Sometimes we have to cross the sinus. So this is a, my way to decide. So you can now uh, understand my, my, my following cases. Shabbat 
So now that we went back to the basis, now the show must go on with the clinical cases. So let's go to the most interesting part of the lecture. And uh, this is a case uh, that I'm going to perform a bilateral sinus lift. Um, and uh, it's a, a, a patient that didn't have any retention with the, the prosthesis. We had some epilepsy and some problems. And it has a big bone atrophy with pneumatization of, of the sinus, as you can see here on the uh, OPT and uh, on the CT. And uh, we're going to show you how did I solve the situation. So this was the initial situation, this, the status. And then in this case, I did a different approach, okay? Sometimes I do some uh, outside the boxes approach, and I try to do the sinus lift, maintaining the tools that were uh, lost, okay? But just to maintain my temporary prosthesis longer and more comfortable, and then I only extracted the tools when I placed the implants some months after, okay? So this is not like the, the traditional approach. The traditional approach is to extract the tooth and then uh, do the, the sinus. But in this case, I did this for um, the comfort of the patient. It's more difficult, but it's possible. So as you can see, the window is uh, higher. Uh, and then you can uh, uh, go to the Schneider membrane and uh, do the bone wall. And uh, you can see here, the, the palatal wall after raising the Schneider membrane. And here you can see a small video showing that there were no perforation. Uh, normally I use the, the, the bone of the wall to, to the new ceiling, to, to construct the new ceiling, but you also can remove the, the, the bone of the wall. There's different techniques to, to do it. This is my favorite one and I think it's the simplest one. Here, then, I put it some uh, collagen plug um, uh, just to protect, but I didn't have any penetration. But I do it for protocol. It's not a collagen membrane, it's a collagen plug, it's more uh, soft uh, and it's also hemostatic. And then I use some uh, xenograft to collagen uh, from porcine origin from Osterbiol. Also, sometimes I use some putty biomaterial that is uh, also from Osterbiol, but is a little bit softer just to seal um, the sinus and avoid the, the granula of the xenograft to get out of the, of the sinus. And here I do a collagen membrane on top, uh, suture with the supramid four zeros, and sometimes five zeros, in this case it's four zeros. And this is after one week. You can see here also the post-op x-ray. And this, I did exactly the same thing on the other sinus, okay? And uh, after six months of healing, everything looked okay. The patient didn't have any complaints, uh, but I had some surprises. One of the sinus was very good, the, the, the bone that I, I, I made the graft, and the other was with problems. So I'm going to show you also how I solved that problem. So I knew that um, the, the quality of the bone was not good, the quantity was not good. Uh, that's why I did a bilateral sinus lift first. But I knew also in the anterior zone that I had like very thin uh, ridge. So uh, in these cases, I do um, a specific approach that um, is called palatal approach uh, to avoid sometimes big grafts. This patient didn't want to go for more surgeries. Uh, so this was my approach. We have to... to do the, the specific treatment or the more specific treatment to the patient that we have. So, and uh, not only to the patient in terms of economics and health issues and several um, uh, topics. So, here, after extracting uh, the tools that were lost, okay, after cleaning everything, opening, you can see here it was not very good. And in the front, we had like very, very thin ridge. So in this case, or I do like a lot of uh, grafts and wait for several months, or uh, I have to do a different approach. The, the, my um, treatment plan for this case was with a hybrid situation. So I was not very concerned uh, with the, 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 the support of the lip because I can uh, support the lip with the prosthesis. I can, give it some uh, acrylic uh, volume. So in this case, uh, my option was 
to clean everything. And then I had this uh, problem that I have a sinus uh, pathology. So in this case, I had to clean everything. I call it black hole. And uh, uh, I will explain you uh, what I did next. So basically, I use a, lo a lot of low-level laser therapy. I have the red and infrared lasers. Uh, the red laser is used for anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial. It is used for with a, a blue dye, and uh, the other one, the infrared, is more used for bioestimulation of healing. So in this case, um, this has several applications. Uh, but uh, in this case, the 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 use that I, I, I did was with the red laser uh, as antimicrobial photodynamic therapy or APT. Uh, because I, I, I use a dye and then I rinse and then the, the red laser will kill the bacteria, okay? So let's show how to do the uh, photodynamic therapy antimicrobial. So we put the blue dye, uh, we rinse the excess with saline. We have to be one minute with the dye and then rinse for one minute. And then I use the um, uh, red laser, uh, 660 nanometers. Um, in, in several points, one minute and a half per point, okay? And this will decontaminate the, the pus. I do this a lot in post extractional situations or that I have some pathology so I can perform um, my, my input more safely. As you can see here, I did my palatal approach. So uh, in the front area, instead of going in the crest, because if I go in the, in the crest with the first bird, I will destroy everything. So I go palatal because palatal the bone is much harder and much more stable. And uh, uh, in the back, I go uh, in the other of the, the extraction sockets. As you can see here, uh, the implants that I placed for uh, bread and food sky, and they are all um, kind of long, um, the, the, the zero one are a little bit short because I had that problem, uh, but uh, most of them are 14 and 15. And you can see the torques were not very high as, as expected. So here uh, you can see the position of the palatal approach. I'm measuring the ISQ, as I told before. And these were my ISQ, they were not so bad for the situation, but of course with these conditions, I should not uh, load the implants. So, in this case, I put a cover screw, you know. But now I need to do uh, regeneration and I need to solve the problem of my sinus lift that failed. So, I'm using a lot of PRF. Um, the PRF can be used traditionally as APRF uh, can be plus on membranes and the IPRF as injectable um, liquid or a stake bone or sticky bone, okay? So in this case, um, I'm going to show you that I use the APRF, and with the APRF, um, I'm going to also um, uh, mix with uh, some uh, xenograft, and uh, I'm going to use this, and also as a plug and a membrane on the, uh, the rupture of that uh, sinus lip problem. So you can see here, this is the situation, and uh, I'm going to show how I solved the situation. You can see here the blue dye, it's about yellow blue, and now it's decontaminated. And I had the problem that I had a big hole and I, 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 I had to somehow stable the Schneider membrane. So I, I remember to suture that Schneider membrane to the wall of the, of the sinus. In this case, I used, of course, the uh, resolvable um, uh, suture, uh, vicryl, uh, in this case, is uh, four zeros. And because the wall was thin, I could pass through the wall with a needle. Otherwise, I have to use a bird to do this procedure. So I stabilized uh, the membrane that was very thick because it had an inflammatory chronic process. And uh, then I used the uh, uh, PRF uh, membranes, and then in this case, I even put a, a collagen membrane also more rigid, and I then used uh, the uh, the bone material together with PRF to be more sticky and more stable, and has growth factors as uh, you know, 
Uh, so to stimulate to stimulate the, the, the healing uh, in a more fast way. So this was my approach to solve this problem. And then I have to deal with the front. So instead of going uh, doing the graft uh, vestibulary, I'm going to do palatal. Okay. So this is traditional GBR, um, membrane, uh, bone. In this case, I use plasma, okay, as you can see. And this is uh, after finishing the, the surgery. This is 10 days post-op, one month post-op, six months post-op, okay? So here in the day of the surgery, of course, I didn't have stability to do immediate oral healing. So I used the old prosthesis with the tissue uh, uh, conditioner and the patient uh, was like this. And this is the x-ray immediately um, after the, the surgery. And you can see the, the, what I did in the sinus on the left side. And this is the final uh, rehabilitation. In Portugal, we use a lot of uh, uh, metalloacrylic uh, spiritane rehabilitation. Um, they are not ceramic, they are metalloacrylic, but they work quite well, um, of course, they are cheaper than the other situation, uh, and in Portugal we use it a lot. So with six hamper, with six implants, uh, a final hybrid metallic rehabilitation. So we, we talked initially on um, uppercase that was kind of demanding because it was very thin and had uh, to do the sinus, and then one sinus failed. Because it's always important to show not only the success, but the failures, because we learn much more with the failures than with the successes. And um, now I'm going to talk about uh, inferior case. That was a case that was referred by a colleague that is from Italy, Dr. Piero Luigi Catella, that had a patient that had the, the, the indication to do a nerve uh, transposition. And he came with a patient to my country, to my city, to Porto, and I did the nerve uh, lateralization. I controlled the patient only two days, and then uh, she returned to Italy, and uh, Dr. Pierre Luigi Casella, that is a prosthodontist, uh, did the, the, the prosthodontic part with provisionals and soft tissue grafting, and then the finals, okay? This was uh, the patient. She already had uh, lost one of the implants, and the other one, it was almost lost. And um, we have to have some considerations, okay, about the nerve. As we all know, uh, the inferior of the nerve is a sensitive nerve. So the most that can happen to the patient is a paresthesia. Uh, we can't have any motor imbalance because the nerve is not motor. Uh, it has an oblique project. So normally we can do this procedure normally till first or second molar in very difficult situations, not um, um, more bad than that. Uh, and there's uh, different techniques to, to mobilize the nerve with high success. I'm going to show one of them. I do, uh, I have cases of all the techniques, but I know for me, at least in my experience, this one is the, the one with the higher success, even in terms of uh, recover from the parasitia that normally recovers very fast. So this technique, the lateralization or transposition, has a very specific um, indication, like all the techniques. So we have to have at least eight millimeters of total height of the posterior mandible, not to the nerve, total height, to avoid that when we do the window, like it was a spinal switch, but on the lower jaw, uh, we don't break the, 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 the mandible. And also, uh, the other indication uh, is that we have to have severe atrophy of the mandible with less than nine millimeters on top. Of course, if I have nine millimeters, I don't use this technique. I use short implants, normally seven uh, or six, depending on the brands. But um, uh, I only do this kind of uh, procedures normally when I have like very, very uh, quantity of four, uh, three, four millimeters. Because otherwise there are other techniques that are also visible and less, uh, um, less traumatic to the patient. So this is the only technique that is mandatory uh, to use piezo surgery. As everyone knows, piezo cuts the heart tissue but doesn't cut the soft tissue. So it's very uh, important to use this technique with piezo. 
But when we do uh, a nerve uh, lateralization, we don't cut anything and we mobilize the inferior nerve, the mental nerve, and the incision nerve. But if we do a transposition of the nerve, we have to cut the incisive part, never the inferior nerve, never the mental nerve that goes to the lip, but the incisive part has to be cut to be mobilized. So when we do a uh, transposition, we have to cut this um, incisive part three millimeters in front of the mental nerve. Okay, I'm going to show the technique, but just be aware of this um, specific uh, condition. And to revert para uh, temporary paresthesia, I, I have a specific protocol. <clears throat> I use corticotherapy during and after the surgery for a few days. I use PRF to involve the nerve to stimulate the Schwann cells and the, 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 the neurons to, to quicker recover. <clears throat> I use vitamin B complex, 1, 6, and 12. In Portugal, we call Neurobion, but probably there's more uh, other names. And I use it normally for two months. Sometimes it's not needed so, so much, but normally for two months and low-level laser therapy uh, for the stimulation, as I told you before, uh, 660 and 780. So this was the initial situation of the patient that came with the, the doctor from Italy, as you can see. And uh, if you remember well, she already had lost one implant uh, on the 400, and the other implant was uh, also with problems, you can see here. So we have to do an explantation. So we removed that old implant that was a burn mark, MK4, and we localized the nerve. This is how we start this procedure. Uh, you can see here uh, with a torque wrench in a um, specific uh, um, uh, force, uh, 200 newtons, we removed uh, the, the implant. You can see here, the implant was a little bit buckled. So we tried to correct a little bit uh, the, the angulation. And I'm using the same um, technique I used before in the upper jaw with the low level laser therapy with the blue uh, dye, that is elbow blue, to decontaminate the, the, the place because I want to put the implants uh, immediately. So I am mobilizing the mental nerve, as you can see. This has to be delicate, of course. And I'm using a, a pencil to mark the, the, the window I want to do that has to be parallel to the basis of the mandible. And uh, I'm using um, elastic stretch that I use from my glove, from a steric, uh, steri, sterile glove. I cut the, the upper part and I use it to retract without pulling too much. You can use other things, but this is the most uh, easy to, to get and less expensive. Um, so here, as you can see with piezo, as I told, we are doing the window to localize the nerve inside the bone. We are seeing only the mental at this time. And here the window is bigger, okay? And then with some chisel, um, normally I, I use to remove the, the lateral wall of the mandible. And in this case, I maintained part of the um, mental foramina and I, I managed to block it this way. Sometimes you can't, so if you can't, uh, you have to remove all uh, around the nerve and put it back. So as you can see here, I slide it, uh, the, the, a little bit of the mental foramina. As you can see here, I'm removing the nerve and you can see the bone all around. Uh, the nerve has a fascia around it, okay? And and here I have to have a good team, of course, helping me, a good assistant, a good doctor that is helping me to um, stretch the, the nerve while I'm preparing for my implants because I have to put the implant in the same uh, day because otherwise it's not logical, the technique. So now I'm using all the, the length of the mandible to put the bicortical bic anchorage uh, of, uh, of implants. In this case, I use the implants of Brad and Kuskai tree. Uh, two on the uh, area that she already lost the other implant and one on the other that, uh, place that I removed the implant in this state, the next rotation. You can see here, I tried to correct a little bit the angulation on the front one. And you can see here the implants in place. 
even if it's a complex procedure, um, the, the stability normally is very high. In this case, I can tell that um, the top was more than 50 in all of them, and the ISQ was more than 80. So technically, I could do immediate ruling in this case, but uh, to be honest, I'm crazy, but not that crazy. So in cases that I have uh, very delicate procedures or I have some uh, risks of fracturing the mandible, I prefer to wait. So I waited uh, for a few months, and normally in these cases I wait at least uh, six months. Uh, after two months I put a provisional, but uh, the final normally I only do after six months to have time to healing and not avoiding uh, some disaster of uh, fracturing the, the mandible. Because here we're doing bicortical anchorage. We have the bone all around, but we are doing bicortical anchorage. And then I'm using, as I said, the PRF around to simulate um, the recovering and some bone graft and tall block room because I removed one block and then um, I'm not going to, 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 to send it to the trash. I'm going to uh, use a bone meal and my autologous bone is very precious. So I meal it, okay, and then I mix it with my PRF and I use it again in the places I meet. Here you can see after suturing the supramid 4.0, that is a polyamid, okay. Normally I take this, the, the stitches after 15 days. But in the day of the surgery, I do uh, the first session of uh, laser therapy, red and infrared. Uh, this is the protocol, okay. The infrared is more um, high level and uh, is one minute and a half per point and the red one is only 10 seconds per point and is a, a lower doses, okay? Um, and this together with all the information that I said before. This is the x-ray immediately after surgery. As you can see, we are touching the basis of the mandible. There's no problem because we have a big mandible with uh, bone all around. And this is the mapping of the paresthesia after two days. Okay, so the recovery of this patient was really fantastic. After two days, she only had this tiny um, area that, that, didn't hit, that, that she was not feeling. And then the protocol should be between six to 10 uh, sessions of laser therapy, low level laser therapy, together with vitamin uh, B and some measures. And in this case, the, the, the patient uh, uh, went to, to Italy with uh, the doctor that went to, to Portugal with the patient. And uh, after two, three weeks, she was per almost recovered. After one month, she was perfectly recovered. So it was a very quick recovery in this case. These are the provisionals that were made. Uh, the, the prosthodontic part was made by the colleague that referred the case to me. I did the surgery and he did the prosthodontics. So Dr. Pierluigi Casella is a prosthodontist in Italy and he did the provisionals and the, the, the final. The provisionals use some BOHPP abutment. They are a material that have some uh, um, uh, shock absorber um, behavior. So it's good to avoid uh, big um, hitting the, the, the implants. And here you can see uh, initial situation after healing, initial situation after provisionals, and then this is the, the provisionals, and then he did um, uh, some free gingival graft to, to improve the soft tissue and to improve the recognized gingival around the implants, and at the end he finished with a metallic ceramic uh, bridge um, uh, with pink uh, ceramics, because with this technique we can't uh, build uh, in, in high, we are putting the implants from the, the place we have um, low, not high. So this is the technique. But the patient was very satisfied with the result. And this was a CVCT that we made two years after the procedure, just to know that uh, the new foramen uh, was in the new place that we put it. And you can see there in the, in the slide, uh, very defined the, the new foramina after two years of uh, the procedure. So let's, um, I started with the upper case, a difficult one, a lower case, difficult one. Now let's show one that is um, medium, okay, upper and lower. Yes. yes. Five minutes, Raquel. Okay, I will try to go faster, okay. 
So this is more um, straightforward case, um, uh, immediate loading in fast and fix or, or on for uh, procedure. Um, and you can see the, 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 the patient has a severe periodontal problem. This is initial status. So then we extract the tooth. We only maintain temporarily the, the, the last teeth to, to uh, improve uh, seeing the, the vertical dimension and because of proprioception, okay? But then at the end, they're going to be removed. So in the, in the lower, we, we did like four straight implants, red and blue sky, good insertion torque, good ISQ, as you can see, two plus extraction, the other one were heel sites, multi-unit abutments, but the, the ones that are uh, straight. Look at the ISQ, very good. So in this case, we could do it with one. In the upper, uh, it was a little bit more complex situation because we had a cyst on the 21 on the central incisor. After extracting, you can see that it was kind of a mess on the 21 local. And um, you can see here that uh, we used the low level laser therapy, the OBU, to do the contamination. And uh, here we are using the aggregated implants, as you know. Uh, they are very successful in the literature and I'm using this protocol for many years. So the, the distal implants are very tilted because the sinus were very prematized, okay? In this case, I, I, I did it with four implants. Uh, ideally, I like to do it with six, but sometimes the patient doesn't have a lot of um, economic possibilities, so sometimes we do it with four. And you can see here the angulations and then in the front, one was cross extractional, the other one was palatal approach, as I show in the first case. Okay, one more palatal because this is also for an hybrid situation. So you can see uh, length, uh, good length, good torque, good ISQ. I'm going to show as you can see here. Final abutment, ideally. So the, the, the contact one abutment on time. To drain the bone and save the tissue, and uh, some bone grafts, some membranes, suturing. As I said, the concept one about the bone trying. This was picked up in the in the clinic uh, and go to the laboratory just to polish. Is a, a, a traditional um, uh, acrylic um, provisional with no even uh, bar, no metal bar. Um, and this was how the patient went and how the patient. Uh, went to, to home, okay? And you can see the angulation of the distal ones are not uh, easy to do. They are really 45 degrees or more. In this case, they are more. So you have to be uh, sure that the brand that you are using has the um, uh, uh, correct abutment for you to correct this kind of angulation or you have to do a individualized uh, abutment. But in the lower, as you can see, was a little bit more straightforward case. So let's jump into conclusions. Um, uh, so as a conclusion, I think it's, it's very important to, to give simple taking home messages. And uh, this, I think, we are looking for. Um, so as my first conclusion, general conclusion, I can say that nowadays with the new technologies, we can practice implantology in more efficient, faster and safer way. Uh, because we have all these new methods, all the new technology, PRF, low-level laser therapy, CVCT, piezo, all this stuff that can help us uh, working much better. Then, uh, going back to the basics, uh, these are very essential information that I think is very important to everyone to, to, to know, that probably most of, of you already know, but I think it's never too much to insist. The torque measures the rotational stability, but only once. So only in the implant placement. The ISQ measures the accessibility several times. You can do the follow-up, even if it's 10 years after, you can measure the ISQ and compare to the, the implant placement and, and see how is the, the, the evolution. The bone density today, with the, the new trends of using the TC and the CBCT, we can measure the, the bone density before going to surgery. Okay, in a more objective way, not very subjective like the other classifications, the old uh, classifications, so in house museum, in the beach classification. And then this is like the basic rule that you can use for every system of implants. Of course, each implant, sometimes you can 
uh, adjust a little bit, but this is not the, the domain. And if you uh, uh, follow this guideline, you, you will be safe. Uh, for single implants, immediate loading should be ideally toward more than 45 ISP, more than 72. And for multiple, because they are together like the ballerinas I showed, um, immediate loading should be toward more than 40 and ISP, more than 70. Another taking home message um, is um, I'm a little bit crazy, I'm a little bit bold. Uh, I'm a woman in a men's world, so sometimes I have to uh, change myself, uh, challenge myself and um, to try to do something uh, a little bit different, a little bit harder. And uh, what I'm saying is, I'm not saying to do a nerve authorization if you are not experienced, uh, but if you have the experience, uh, try to do it, even if you start doing with someone by your side, but start to do it because if you never try, you never do it. So I'm finishing my presentation. Thank you very much uh, to all. Uh, sorry for the technical uh, problems. Uh, this is my Instagram, my uh, email, my personal email, my group, uh, that some of you know, that is called Paul Red, that is dedicated to surgery. And um, I'm here to answer the questions and uh, to try to make this uh, uh, session an interesting one. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel, for the great presentation, for the awesome content for, for our uh, audience. And no, we can start with the questions. We have some questions, many questions on Facebook, some on um, here on uh, Demio. I'm uh, going to start with the first okay. question. Let me try to. <laughs> <laughs> you are selecting, or should I read the question? Uh, also read from Jafar Sadek Pakro. Very nice to you prefer one. Uh, do you prefer distraction, uh, vertical augmentation, nerve reposition, or short implant? As in most of nerve lateral lateralization, we will have unlow loss of sensation. Okay. Yeah. So as I said, uh, each technique has its own indication. Uh, I prefer the best technique for that patient. So in that uh, option that I showed, I prefer the laboratorization, and many times I use other techniques. Sometimes I do graphs, sometimes I do short implants, sometimes I do tilted implants, sometimes I do distraction. To be honest, I don't use a lot, uh, but it's also a, a, a way to do it. So it depends on the case. It depends on the health of the patient. It depends on the age of the patient. It depends uh, um, if the, the, the economic part of the patient. So. Is a lot of facts and also uh, the, the indications of the technique because some techniques are more indicated in one case than in another case. In that case, I only have like three millimeters on top of the nerve. So to do an extraction is not possible because I don't have enough bone to cut and to fix the structure to do the extraction. For instance, short implants will not be possible because I don't have two millimeters implants. So, of course, if I have, as I told when I was explaining the, the, the case, if I will have like seven, even if it's just uh, near the nerve, I prefer sometimes to go in seven, okay? Uh, because I do a lot of implant experience, so I, I, I go to the limit. Or even two spots sometimes the nerve. Sometimes the nerve is on outside and that's response for lingual. So there's so many techniques, but you have to choose the right technique uh, for that specific situation, for that specific patient. But regarding the paresthesia, um, I do this uh, procedure a lot. I have a lot of referred cases, and uh, I'm I started doing it around seven years ago. And I have uh, cases of all the kind of techniques. And uh, for me, the success is very, very good. Uh, and the, the the time of recovering of the paresthesia. The case I, I had that took more time uh, was a case of uh, pure la nerve lateralization of the three nerves, and that one was the one that took more time to recover and took about five months to recover, okay? But it started to recover uh, step by step, okay? It doesn't recover like one day to another. Uh, but normally it takes about one month and a half, two months uh, of recover from a paresthesia, not a, a motor, um, problem. So normally, of course, the patient has to be very enlightened and uh, of course sign a formal consent and be aware of what we are doing and why we are doing because 
many times is the last solution that we have to solve the problem. I hope I, I, I answered the question. <laughs> I'm not hearing. Okay. Omit Panahi is asking why you use 60 millimeter fixture instead of 30 millimeter. It's a it's properly broke the jaw with the high pressure. Look, when we just in this case of normalization or in general, I'm not really respond either. Okay, so if I have uh, 18 millimeters, uh, I prefer to use 16 than use 14. In, in a case of nerve lateralization, why, why I'm using 16 and not 14? Because I'm doing a window, okay? And if I do a window, I have to have, I have to be sure that the implant is anchored in the lower jaw, in the, the basis of the mandible. If I use a shorter implant, I will not have the, the stability on the lower jaw, I only have on the upper. So the stability of the implant is not going to be good because I'm removing all the bone, all the window, all the, the medulla bone outside. So I, I lose a lot of stability. So that's why I need to um, do what we call bicortical anchorage. Even when I do uh, a trophic case, like I show in the upper jaw, I always try to do like bicortical anchorage. It's, it can be in the sinus, it can be in the nasal fossa, because the implant will be much more stable because it has two cords corticals to block the, the movement, the actual movement. Thank you, Raquel. I, 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 <laughs> I want to uh, send the question from uh, from Facebook user. Location of the nerve affect the procedure for nerve transfer, transposition if more lingual position. Yeah, that's why I was showing the, the normal anatomy. The nerve is crossing from lingual to vestibular, okay? So that's why in some cases you can go to sixth position, to first molar, sometimes you can go to second molar, but normally only to first molar because it goes lingually, okay? But as you know, the mental nerve is always buccal, it's always vestibular. So uh, we have to start from there. We have to localize the, the mental nerve and then, uh, of course, having a CBCT or a TC before. But normally, he has a very predictable uh, trajectory. okay? Sometimes it's more uh, buckly, sometimes more lingually, yes, but normally he has a bleak um, uh, path uh, to lingual, but more distally. So that's why we can't go too much uh, um, uh, to the to the back of the mandible because it crosses to lingo. Thank you very much. We have many questions here on Facebook and uh, meeting Kazakaya, one speaker of our team. Are, I have to say his uh, message to you, okay. message, uh, Raquel. Hi, Sheriff. Say hello to Raquel. After the wonderful presentation, we will be ha very happy to see her in Turkey after this pandemic completely lost. Who knows, I've never been to Turkey. <laughs> I, wow. Well, no, never, no one never invited me to speak in, in Turkey. Uh, <laughs> this, this was the official indicting for Metal Kazim. <laughs> Kaya to Istanbul, the one of the most no, beautiful been, cities. Never been. I, I've actually in many countries, uh, more than 25, but not uh, never in Turkey. <laughs> Maybe in the future. Maybe, yes. Okay. Uh, 